Okay, hey. there we go. We are now live. We will get people streaming in here as we go. Well, welcome to tonight's show. And those who are joining us for the first time, um, I always like to give, let me kind of stop this over here. Excuse me just a second or else we'll get a feedback loop from the Facebook Live. There we go. Um, so if you're joining us for the first time tonight, please keep your microphone and your camera off. The way we always organize these shows, we like to get to know, tonight we have some very special guests, but we always like to get to know our guests first kind of find out a little bit about them, find out what makes them tick, what brings them to this spot. Uh, and tonight we get to actually review their book a little bit, discuss the upcoming, very upcoming, I understand, like within the next couple of days, if I'm not mistaken. So- uh, next, we, next uh, few weeks it will be, it will be released. Okay. And next the few next weeks. few days we'll have a link. A way to pre-order it. Yeah. Okay. okay, fantastic. So um, we are going to be discussing their book and getting to know them. We always start for the first little while to get to know you, bring you, what brought you to this point? What brought you to write this book? Why did you decide like, okay, after we've moved on, we've gotten married, we found each other, why go back and write a book about it? Like, how can we help other people, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we'll get into that and then get into your book in the second part of the show. But First, let's start to, by welcoming Kathy and Jeff uh, to the show tonight. How are you guys? We're doing great. We're doing great. Fantastic. Now, how do you pronounce your last name properly? Tykert. Tykert. Okay. I kept saying Tychert, and I'm like, I don't think that that's right. So Tykert. Some of you might have heard of the artist Minerva Tykert. She's my great grandmother anyway. Oh, oh nice. Cool. Very cool. Good. Do you have some of that ability passed down to you? Uh, I'm a writer more than a than a visual artist. I never really tried it, so I don't know if I have the gift or not. Okay, well, <laughs> we'll find out, I guess, right? If uh, if we can get you to do a little uh, painting for us sometime. Art sampling. Put you on the spot, yeah. I can't even make stick figures straight. Like, I'm the worst artist you will ever see. So I have no artistic ability, and I have no shame in telling everybody, like, I just, I can't. That's not me. That's not my forte. I wish I've tried. It just doesn't happen. Even if I had the talent, I don't have her education in it. So uh, I spent years and years with the best artists in the United States. You know, I, I have awesome. Had. It's very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Well, you guys have kind of written this amazing book that is aimed specifically at mid singles, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. But before we do. I want to kind of rewind the clock a little bit and talk about you individually and how you guys got into this whole thing before you met each other. How did you even get into the mid singles program? Tell us your story. Let's start ladies first with Kathy. Tell us a bit about you. Well, I was married at 19 and I had two boys with, um, with my former spouse mm -hmm. and uh, when they were one and three and a half, uh, we got divorced. And so I entered the mid singles community divorced, uh, and single for the first time since before my twenties. And I was so, about 33 at that time. So we'd been married 14 years. Okay. So you waited quite a while to have kids then I'm just doing the math in my head and I'm uh, thinking one in three and a half, like I had my first one, I was 27. Okay. So we just, I wasn't ready for a while and, and we went to school and uh, there was just a lot of things we were working through and I thought that we had worked through them but it really turned out to not be the case. But, um, you know, I, I really, I love my boys and I'm so glad that we have them. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a decision we made intentionally and, um, and it was great to have kids when we were ready. Great. Okay, so you enter the mid single scene at 30, 31? 33. 33, okay, all right. So, you, all right, I'm trying, I just am doing the math in my head. If you had your first boy at 27, so he was about six at that time when you entered the scene, right? Wait. Or would have been five, five and a half, six. six. Anyways, okay. <laughs> so, stop hammering this point. About just... Everett, he is neither an artist nor a mathematician. Nor a mathematician, that's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I'm just, I'm thinking basic math here, child at 27, entering at 33, like, 
That's not three and a half. Like, okay. <laughs> we, you don't even have to get the math, Everett. You can just ask her what happened. Man. I'm sorry. I think it was four and a half in one because they're three and a half years. It's ago. okay. I mean, we're totally off topic here. It just, in my mind, I always count everything. I'm neuro like when I go to, I've literally been to Walmart and made them go back and look because I was a dollar off in my thinking on what it should be. I was right, but I, you know, I'm neurotic that way. Anyways. I digress. So, and then you paid that extra dollar and you could leave. No, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. They, no, they you got it back. <laughs> they brought the price back down. Yeah, I got my dollar, darn it. It took me like <laughs> half an hour to have them go do a price check and everything. Well, else. It was definitely worth it, you know. So that worth it. That hey, that, that's two bucks an hour. That's two bucks an hour. Hey, that's man. Right. <laughs> I'm taking the Sam Walton principle, right? That guy was cheap. No joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, sorry. Okay, totally off topic there. Uh, so, okay, you entered the scene at 33. Tell us a little bit about that. Because for those of us who have been married and then kind of go back in or get recycled, I know how it feels, but tell the rest of us your story on that. Like in the headlights, that's how it feels. And I did not know how to be single. I had a lot of codependency issues. I didn't even know what that meant. Uh, but, uh, from the experiences I had in my first marriage, I just, I did not know how to be alone. And so I fell into the first relationship that came along. I didn't really date. I didn't be, I wasn't intentional about seeking someone, you know, perfect for me. I just went the direction that came to me. And so I ended up getting remarried and that didn't end up working out. Uh, we were married about a year and a half and, uh, it probably should have been more like six months because um, there was some emotional abuse, but he's a, he's a really good person. Um, like he has a tender heart. He just didn't know how to handle his emotions. And unfortunately it just wasn't going to go the way of being able to make it better. And, and no kids out of that second marriage. Okay. No, but I did gain a, uh, a stepdaughter for a while. So I know what it's like to be a stepmom, And that was, uh, a good experience and I'm still in touch with her. Um, she, she now has babies of her own oh, um, sweet. Her when she joined our household. And um, so, and I learned so much from his family during that time too. So I don't, I actually don't regret either marriage anymore. Like, I don't think I ever really totally did. I mean, I definitely felt that, wow, I've wasted my, like most of my, you know, younger years and, uh -huh. and and now what do I have to show for it? I'm starting over. And that was hard. Um, but but I, I learned through prayer and through temple attendance that those were part of my path. Um, I didn't know what it was leading to, but it was definitely part of my path. And I accepted that. And I learned how to be more comfortable on my own for several years. Because after that marriage ended, I decided to get really intentional about seeking I think I probably dated at least 80 people um, and some were before and some were after I met Jeff because we didn't just go straight to the altar or anything. We, we <laughs> knew each years. other. Yeah, it took two years. Two years. All right. So um, the time between when you got divorced the first time and you got remarried for your second marriage, how long was that? Mm -hmm. Let's see, the divorce was final in August of 2012. And that was just a few, like, just like three days before what would have been our 14th anniversary. Okay. And then uh, I got remarried in January of 2018. So we had quite a long courtship. I didn't just jump into the marriage itself, but I did jump into the relationship and uh, it grew from there and, and then dissolved from there. So how long did you guys date before you got married? Us? Uh, not Well, you and Jeff were two years. You, Jeff already told us that. But your, for your second marriage, the one that was a year and a half, was that one really well, quick? That would have been... So we started dating after my divorce was final and and then got married in January 2018. So about a year, okay. a few months. Okay. All right. Great. So, okay, how long have you and Jeff been married then? Three and a half years, right? Yeah, it'll be for next May. Okay, so I'm, all right. So you and Jeff got married in 2018, correct? Right. Okay, your second husband, when did you marry him? 2014. 
2014. Okay. So in between 2012 and 2014 is when you kind of met this other guy, had a relationship. And how long was that relationship? Um, that one was forced in the spring of 2015. Okay. But did you date him long before you guys got married? I guess is my, my question. Uh, was that one was a was it a whirlwind type of situation or no um no it was a good year okay as was my first marriage so okay. neither of them were like jump in okay i'm trying to get the picture here because i know there's a lot of people who especially if you've been in a relationship for a long time there's that void that you feel right like I remember when I got divorced, like one of the things I like to do at night was reach over and just feel them next to me. Like sometimes in the middle of the night you wake up. Yeah. And there's just nothing there. And so you're, it just, it's like something's missing and all too often people are like, I've got to fill that hole. Like that void has to be filled quick and that's how mistakes get made. Right. So well, think, one way. Yeah. And I do think that was a mistake um, that I made as far as the codependency and having to fill that void. Um, and you know, there were, but at that point you just weren't married yet, but you had the emotional connection already. Right. Right. Yeah. That happened. See, and I think that's the thing we need to be careful about because it's not just how long we, we think, well, you got a date for a year and then you get married, but it's like, I think there are people who do it smarter in six months than some people who date for a year and a half, you know? And so it's not just the quantity of time. It seems like it's the quality, it's the quality of the courtship, I guess you could say. Right. And that's why the first eight chapters of intentional courtship are dedicated to becoming peaceful with yourself and being ready for a relationship in a healthy way. I like it. Yeah. All right. So it sounds like you've kind of been through the gamut a little bit. Um, you know, you, the nice thing about your guys' situation, Jeff, you, married Kathy and that was your second marriage correct third third okay oh so you've both been okay brief second marriage too it lasted six months okay okay so I'm I mean I hate to say good but good in the sense that like you guys have experienced that kind of that turnstile for lack of a better word of like you know gosh am I ever going to get this right and I just keep getting like stuck back in this vortex of the singles program that those, they have those dances and the punch and everything else like, oh, get me out of here, right? So we've been there. We know it. And I love the fact that you both have kind of walked that walk. So we'll get into the talk in just a little bit, but fantastic. Well, Jeff, tell us a little bit about that then. Tell us a little bit about your kind of the first, how did that all happen? And then give us the whole gory details. It's gory, all right. Um, so... In 2006, I was a candidate for the Washington State Court of Appeals. Uh, the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals are elected in Washington. Mm -hmm. And I was 38 years old, and I felt like I was, you know, going places and uh, had a lot of endorsements from really high profile people. I mean, former Senator Slade Gorton, among others. Um, the Attorney General up there was a good friend of mine. So uh, and I, I got a lot of support, but it was, it was a tough year and I lost the election. And my former wife, I could see something sort of, some light sort of go out in her when that happened. Because we had put a lot into it, not a huge amount financially, but just time and effort. And, you know, I had a business that was fairly successful, but only fairly and uh, she always thought maybe I, I could do better. Um, and then the 2008 financial crash hit and I was representing a number of construction companies as an attorney and I got left holding the bag for $100,000 of unpaid bills. And so it, it wrecked me financially. And I was working on trying to, to build back from that. But in the middle of all that, I was having a lot of trouble in my marriage. And, you know, long story short, within a two year period of time, I lost everything. I mean, everything Job lost except for my health. Thank heaven for that. 
Um, but uh, anyway, I, I went through a period of probably five years of pretty major depression, uh, both before and after, including time both before and after I got divorced. Um, and I think that was when I made the most serious mistake I ever did, which was move a thousand miles away from my youngest son. Uh, and that's a whole other story, but. It, and like me, he has two boys about three and a half years apart. And thankfully I have a great relationship with that youngest son now. And, um, you know, we get together and talk politics and all kinds of stuff, but. Is he from I mean, Seattle? Uh, yeah, but he's, he's more of my persuasion. Okay. That. All right. I'm in Washington state too. So I know the, I know the territory well. Yes. Bellingham is where I lived and okay. practiced law. Yeah, you were right by the temple. When I was up there, close to the Vancouver, BC temple. Um, oh, Bellingham. I'm thinking Bellevue. Okay. Yep. 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 Bellingham. You're up by the border. Yeah. Right. And I was there, you know, a decade and that's where my kids mostly grew up. And so I, I, I moved back to Utah thinking I got a, a offered a partnership in a law firm down in Provo. And uh, I thought any change would be good change. Cause I mean, I was literally so depressed. I didn't care if I lived or died. I, mean, I wasn't going to attempt suicide or anything, but I, I really didn't care about anything anymore. And um, plus I was living in the same house, albeit on different floors with my former wife. Oh, and wow. That was, I don't recommend that to my worst enemy. Sounds I mean, like a good time. <laughs> was she, was she dating at that time too? So you see other guys coming and going and. She was having, having an affair um, oh. uh, toward the end of our marriage and she's married to the guy now and I have no issues with it uh, anymore. Um, but I, I got to, uh, I, I moved down here to Utah and the, the situation with the law firm didn't really work out. It was not a great fit. Uh, I got hired by a startup company um, as their general counsel, and then they ran out of money and stopped paying me. So I started a law firm again, and I thought, man, if I should have just stayed in Washington because I was in trouble, but at least I was in a community where people knew me and I could get more clients. But... I was kind of in the fix that I was in at that point. And like I said, I, I was depressed and stayed depressed for years. And I, I did date during that early period, but I knew that I had emotional recovery to do. And I knew that I had to recover financially before I was really ready to move, at, move ahead with another marriage. And so everybody I dated, I told them that. I said, you know, I'm recently, divorced, I've got financial issues I need to clean up. And so I'm not saying nothing can ever come of this, but if it does, it's gonna take a while and you should know that. Um, so mostly it was sport dating for the first, you know, for the first couple of years. And uh, sure that's a popular sport in Utah, by the way. So, you know, <laughs> you're in the right place. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, honestly, there are a couple of women that I dated during that period that remain good friends, uh, have remained all, all this time. So, I mean, I'm grateful for that period in my life, even though it was very, very much the hardest period in my, in my whole life. Um, and, and I mean, it was literally just to share one experience. It's in the book too, but uh, I, I was taking my kids back up to Washington after the holidays. And I pulled over in Snowville, Utah at the Flying J. Um, I don't know if you used the bathroom or something, but anyway, I came out after finishing in the, in the Flying J and uh, tried to, to start my car and it wouldn't start. And tried everything I knew how to do, tried to jump the battery, that wasn't the issue, cleaned off the posts, you know, all the stuff you do. And I thought, well, I hope it's not the starter or, you know, the alternator or something like that. But anyway, I, I, uh, I asked the people at Flying J, you know, who do you know around here that knows anything? And they gave me the name of a tow truck guy. And I called him and I said, I don't know what the issue is. It was New Year's Eve. 
So I, I worried that no one was even gonna be willing to come out. So he comes out and he says, you can take your time to think about it. I think your timing belt's gone. And I said, well, you know, what is that gonna take? And he said, oh, to fix it, at least 600 bucks. Well, I, I knew I only had about $300 in my checking account. And I was also needing to get my kids back in time to start school. So all night that night, I'm in the trucker's lounge at the Flying J watching MMA fights with my kids and just feeling the worst sense of I have let everyone I care about down. And here I am, I've got a doctorate and a post-doctorate and look where I am, look where I'm standing. It's just shame like I've never felt it. And I, I called my parents the next day and, and they lent me some money to take care of the car. And, um, and they brought a car to me, uh, their older car, so that I could get the boys back to, and, and it all worked out. But I remember feeling like Scarlett O'Hara, you know, with God as my witness, I'll never be hungry again, you know. Uh, yeah. I'll never be this broke and stranded and whatever again. And then fast forward a year, New Year started to come up and I started to think about that experience a year before and realized that things weren't really all that different. And it was a very kind of depressing thought, but I, I kept pondering and praying about this. Why is, why is my life so terrible? <laughs> um, and the answer that I kept getting was, you are not meant to hide your light under a bushel. You are meant to shine, so shine. And so I started getting a lot bolder about trying to attract clients and things. And a very bold Facebook post got answered by somebody in Texas who said, you, you ought to come move out to Texas, run oil and gas titles. Uh, you probably make pretty good money. And at that time I thought, you know, I don't got anything else going on. So actually my oldest son lived with me, but he moved with me out there. And, uh, and we were in Texas for three years and it was a little breathing room for me. It was, I didn't love the work I was doing, but it paid my bills. It allowed me to start to clean up some of my financial issues. And uh, it allowed me to, you know, <laughs> go out to dinner once in a while or whatever. And so, it, I mean, it just gave me that little bit of extra, you know, the, that little bit of extra money in my pocket that helped out. And uh, my son went on his mission from, from Midland, Texas to uh, Maryland. And, uh, and I met someone out there and we dated for a year, although a lot of it was long distance. And, and we got married and, you know, six months later, well, I, I almost, I knew almost from the beginning that I had made a mistake um, just because of some abusive behavior and so on. It took me six months to actually give up on it, which I realize is a fairly short marriage, but. Um, and how long had you guys dated at that point? Uh, well, when we got married about a year after you started dating. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, at, at the time I, I decided to leave, um, I had, I had gotten laid off shortly before that. And so I was, I didn't have a job and, uh, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do about that. Um, I did find some contract work that helped me sort of keep you know, keep body and soul together. My younger, my, my former wife had sent my youngest son to live with me uh, right before I made the decision to leave my second wife. And I remember the night that I left, um, just a nightmare after a whole nightmare day, um, my son and I were driving and we, we went and checked into a hotel and then we were going to go to a movie and, um, as we were driving to the movie theater, I kind of broke down and I just, I said his name and I said, you know, sometimes I just feel like giving up. 
And my youngest son said, um, dad, you're the most positive person I know. You can't give up. And I've never forgotten that. I've always appreciated those words at that moment because they gave me a little bit of extra feeling that I could, um, that I could make it, that I could stay positive and something good would happen. Well, anyway, I, I, my car at this point was threatening to throw a rod and I limped out to Utah in it with my son and uh, got, got moved out here and I was having to buy a new car and start a new business um, at the same time. And when I met Kathy, I mean, I hadn't even been back in Utah a year. When we first met, I was couch surfing at my parents. I was broke off my behind. And I had a new business that was hardly making any money. And she can testify, I told her all of this on the first day. Um, <laughs> Queen. I told her a, Just so you know. a hot night out might be like a date to McDonald's with two <laughs> items off the dollar menu, right? That's right. And I should probably say that financial security is really, really important to me. <laughs> <laughs> and Isn't that funny? Heavenly Father's like, okay, let's test these, uh, these boundaries y'all have. <laughs> that was a yeah. test for her faith as well. <laughs> But I, I, and by the way, haven't you noticed that though? I like, it's almost like sometimes I think the people were, we may not be meant to marry are the ones that look good on paper. You know, yes. they seem to fit the bill and, and maybe I almost feel like we need to be really careful about writing people off because right. it may be the people that don't seem to be at all good on paper, but there's something about them that's just really solid. They're just really good people. And maybe that's what we should be focusing on first. And it's almost like I, the happiest couples I know, they weren't necessarily each other's dream at the beginning, but they saw something, they saw a light or something and everything they dreamed of ended up coming true eventually, but it's almost like God let them fall in love with just the goodness first. Yeah. And that was all I had at that point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it took. Look, um, it with, with a little trauma mixed in, you know. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, as you're as you're speaking here, Jeff, I keep thinking, like, dude, you gotta start buying a Toyota or something, man. Your car is like you and history with cars not going too well. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's got a good car. I've got now. a good car now. <laughs> oh, good. He watched me build build a law practice here in Utah, and I wasn't depressed when I came back. I was filled with anxiety, but I wasn't depressed. Um but she watched me build a law firm basically from zero to six figures in five years. And, um, you know, I had been here in Utah for, I guess, three or four years before I went to Texas and just never got off the ground. And I think part of that was my own internal struggles and depression and all of that. And that's not a good time to start a business. Um, because you know, you know what some of you know what it's like to start a business that kind of takes everything. And then, uh, interestingly, to you know, I I dated Kathy for the better part of 2016. Uh, she broke up with me. I'm going to make her look bad here. <laughs> Two days before Christmas. Oh, no. Merry Christmas, oh, man! <laughs> On Joseph Smith's Brutal. birthday. Actually, my uh, sister's right. birthday too. Did you wrap up birthday. like a Dear John letter or something type thing? Like, all right, I got this card for you. So when you open it, it's like we're done. I gave him gifts. I gave him lots of well, gifts. Well, we exchanged actually. gifts that day before the breakup. But... Oh, so you still got the gifts. Okay, well, you know. Hey, look. <laughs> yeah, we'll call this your goodbye <laughs> gift. Right. Here's a parting gift. Right. Uh, I was seeing my therapist that day. And I, I said to, I, I told her everything, you know, that she knew everything that had happened. And um, she told me basically, well, you're going to need some time. And Kathy is probably going to want to call you and talk to you and try to make you feel better. And she's the last person in the world who can do that. So take whatever time you need and set firm boundaries. And then when, you know, if you're ready at some point to welcome her back as a friend, 
uh, then then do that. And it, we didn't talk for three months ish. Um, well, four no. months -ish. He gave me a piece of his mind, and then he said, Don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> "You know how much I spent on your yeah, Christmas." Yeah, we forgot. We left that part out. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is that is definitely true, and. <laughs> I think my therapist's advice was good, but I, I probably shouldn't have, you know, left the parting shots. <laughs> you, you may have put a little extra mustard on the hot dog, so to speak. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a rough time for us. <laughs> <laughs> but three months later, we we started talking again, and at first it was, you know, once every few weeks and then it was once a week and then it was every day and you know I mean it it gradually increased so who reached out first just as friends for like all of 2017 uh, who who and who and who did the connection first after okay. you guys broke up because I had asked her not to contact me until I contacted her oh okay um and so you were ready to not be spicy anymore you had to kind of let it <laughs> simmer down yeah and, and yeah. We just wiped some of that mustard off and <laughs> just try. Took a while. Uh, but we started doing things together, you know, in the summer of that, uh, of 2017. And, but it was, we were just friends. I mean, there was no, not so much as holding hands. Um, None of that. And uh, fast forward to that fall, um, I started to get this distinct impression that I was going to get married in 2018. And there were three women that I were, was dating uh, who all wanted something serious. And I knew I was going to have to choose soon. And one of them, incidentally, um, she had contacted Kathy to find out if I was a good guy because she was going to spend a weekend with me. And uh, I didn't know this at the time. Um, and I was six hours late. I didn't tell him because it's like girl code, right? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> six hours late to that weekend date because I was taking her to the doctor because she was sick. But I didn't know that. He didn't and, tell me. <laughs> and then the girl told me on the weekend, guess what I did, you know? Um, and uh, anyway, but she told me, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks after that, you know, um, I think you're a good guy and I like you, but I think you're still in love with Kathy and you need to go see about that. Whoa, truth bomb. Yeah. <laughs> I start tr out. Truth grenade at least. Yeah. And, okay, so Kathy, I, I have a question about this though. Did that sort of spark something in you when you're like, okay, wait a minute. All these other girls are wanting Jeff. So what yeah. the heck? I gotta, get, I gotta jump on this train. Well, oh, yes, well, in a way. Well, no, well, I, I actually said she, he's a great guy, go for it. And oh, okay. I was dating two guys with serious intentions too, but we never talked about it because <laughs> that was our policy. Did the other two guys know that you were dating them both at the same time with serious yes. intentions? Oh, yes. No, I was very open with them. Okay. I just didn't talk to Jeff about it because he didn't want to hear about it. And I knew that. Yeah. The other two women that I was dating, not the one that, that let me go, but the other two, uh, they knew that I was dating the other one also. Um, but I started praying about it probably in November of that year. And the answer I kept getting is the woman you love is right in front of you. And it's not either of these two. And so, uh, New Year's Eve, I don't know what it is about me and New Year's Eve, but I sat down and, and wrote a letter to Kathy, six pages, single space, probably the first letter I'd written by hand for years and years. But um, several times as I'm writing this letter, I'm thinking maybe I should hold back a little bit, not be so vulnerable. Maybe plausible I should. Plausible deniability. Maybe I should leave plausible deniability. <laughs> and I kept thinking, nope, 20 seconds of insane courage. I actually watched Blue <laughs> Bada Zoo that night too. Um, 20 seconds of insane courage, you know. I'm but, but you did like three hours of insane courage. Yeah. You know? To write that letter but I, although the 20 seconds was when you put it in the mail right yeah there you go it was a very bold letter and i mean it told her exactly how i felt and i can't move in any other direction until i know if we might still have something and if you wondered if you still had my heart you do i mean it was really bold and a 
couple of, I don't know, a few days after that, when she got the letter, I got this email, I think it was an email saying, boy, do you know how to complicate a girl's life? I was seriously ill. Like I was really, really sick and deciding between two people, which then became people. Oh, he had to do it. And so but yeah. we both dropped two other people to be together. And we went to Africa together in March and got we, married in May. We thought if for 10 days we like still liked each other at the end that maybe we could get married. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Luck. 10 days in Africa. I could fall in love with just about anybody. But. Okay, John, do you know that 10 days in Africa is actually a board game? I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> but um, <laughs> It's called 10 beautiful days. Do in you Africa. get married at the but end? I don't think so. No, no. Oh, okay. It's a geography so. game. But uh, where, where about in Africa? Where y'all going? Where yeah. did you go? And then My we, sister we spent a... married an Ethiopian and we oh. went to him. And we spent it. Oh, wow. both And to help him immigrate to the States. That is so awesome. Very cool. We spent a cool. Day coming and going in Qatar as well. And incidentally, the two guys I had been dating served in the military, sometimes in the same unit, and both had served in Qatar where we flew through. And um, they were both so, so gracious about the whole thing. They, they remained friends with us. And one of them actually ended up dating and marrying my best friend. Oh, wow. Wow. That's awesome. a story for another day, but that's a great story too. That's awesome. And the third one gets thanks for playing. I know. Yeah. <laughs> There's another point I should well, make. Well, he didn't hang out too. quite so much, but he oh. There we go. <laughs> it's his own fault. <laughs> you said one of them married your best friend, right? Yeah, yeah okay. So yeah. There, there's another point to this story too, I think, because um, I've kind of laid it out there about how low I was a couple of times. Uh -huh. But I, I, uh, I can say a couple of, of things about this. Um, my, I, I, and we did a post on this the other day in, in our group, but Excuse me. I, I, I recently rewatched an interview that President Reagan gave with Tom Brokaw right before he left the White House. And he talked about how he had, was really disappointed about a job he didn't get as a sporting goods section manager in Montgomery Ward. And he said, I, I kept looking for a job. And he talked about how he found a job as a baseball announcer and moved to larger and larger markets uh, as a sports announcer and then into Hollywood as an actor. And then of course into politics and he became president of the United States. And Tom Brokaw says, so if you had gotten the job at Montgomery Wards and he said, might still be working there. And Tom Brokaw said, instead of president of the United States, and he talked to President Reagan also about, you know, he had this legendary love with Nancy, his wife, but he talked about having been engaged to someone who uh, life took them to different places and she ended up marrying someone else. And he said, so if you had married her, and he said, probably wouldn't have what I have now. And I think, you know, if I hadn't lost my job in my corporate job in Texas, I might still be out there running oil and gas titles. If I hadn't lost my second marriage and my first one, I might not have this amazing woman with me. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I really feel like Job, where it says toward the end of the book of Job, God gave Job twice as much as he has as he had before. Now, I didn't mention this, but after five years building my law firm here in Utah, through a strange series of circumstances, which you probably don't want to hear all of it right now. But uh, just a completely unpredictable series of circumstances, I ended up getting offered a job uh, to practice constitutional law full time for the Utah Attorney General, which is like a dream job for me. Mm -hmm. And so I think about that, and, and I make thirty or forty thousand dollars a year more than I did back then. So I think about that, and I think if I hadn't had those tragedies, if I hadn't gotten laid off from my corporate job, if I hadn't gotten divorced for the second time, when I said to my son that I felt like giving up, I wouldn't have all that I have in my life today. And I have a great life now. Yeah. I think it's like what Kathy said earlier, you know, that 
you know, it's just, you know, kind of that idea of how you're, you, you need to let your journey unfold, you know, right. and not try to micromanage that or get guilted or shamed out of, you know, still trying and, and looking for the next step, you know, along the way. I think a lot of us just shut down. Right. And give up, you know. Um, well, by the way, right? my understanding is Job got 100 times. Oh. Not just double. So. I feel like I've got 100 times. I exactly. Oh. And I think some <laughs> things are priceless, right? That's right. And yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't regret any of it. You know, sometimes I think we're tempted to look at difficult circumstances, especially with our Latter-day Saint perspective. It wasn't supposed to be this way. You know, I did everything I was supposed to. I married a return missionary or I was one or, you know, I paid my tithing all this time and I served in the church and you, you know what people say. And yet here, here I am. Here's what happened to me. And the thing is, maybe it was supposed to be that way. And I think for me, it was supposed to be that way. I don't regret my first marriage. I have two wonderful kids that I love with all my heart from that marriage. Me and my former wife are friendly now. You know, we're not enemies anymore. It's When I remember getting to the point where I thought it was supposed to be that way long before I felt that things were starting to work out for me. And that's a really good place to be when you can accept mm -hmm. the, the hardships or the bad things or the things that you never thought you you would experience as a divorced person or a widow or however you are single. Um, if you can accept those things as the way they are supposed to be, maybe before you really start to see the, like wonderful blessings, um, I, I think that's that's a great um, a great faithful place to be and i think a place mm -hmm. where which will put you in a, a more hopeful position to receive blessings in the future if yeah. i had known about radical acceptance back then i would have saved myself several years of depression me too as you're talking it kind of reminds me of uh you guys remember the story of the current bush uh by elder hugh b brown and then yeah. elder so christopherson kind of yeah I love that allegory. I mean, it's it's just pretty much exactly what you're describing with yourself. Um, and I love it. I mean, obviously, what you did going through all of these trials, and for this is perfect because in the mid singles program, single adult program in general, right? Uh, I think there's a lot of times people just feel like, when is it going to end? Like, when do my trials stop? When can I like? get my job back, get married, get whatever, you know, get on a normal track of my life. Um, let me ask you a question. Did you guys like at any point, and you don't have to go into details, but one of the things I keep thinking is holding on to that rod. And even when you're in those darkest moments and you feel like letting go, still holding on eventually brings you out of that fog to the other side and to where all the blessings are. Did either of you guys kind of take a step away and say, I just, I can't do it right now. I know there's a lot of people that do that and just feel completely devastated in their life for losing a job, a spouse or both or what have you. And they just, it's too much for them, right? And they just think I, the trials are never ending and I just can't do it anymore. Did you guys hold on or was there a time where you're just kind of like, I just need to take a step back? Well, for me, it wasn't so much a conscious thing. I was just depressed out of my mind, like, and constantly thinking about things I had no control over. My ex-wife did this, she did that. You know, when we were married, this is the way it was, and it was so unfair. And, you know, there was a lot of that going on in my head. And I think I, I really like the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And I add a little thing to that. Also, God grant me that I may accept the things I cannot change so that I can have serenity because I think those two work together. Um, but if I had been able to focus more at that point on, okay, what's next, what's ahead, instead of thinking about what I have, 
that would have would have helped a lot. And it, ultimately, that's what I think did help pull me out of it. Well, and I think you're talking spiritually. So I'll answer that question first. And then um, I want to talk about something else real quick. Okay. Um, so spiritually, I actually had to step away from religious activity in my 20s, in my first marriage, because I had experienced quite a bit of what I would say spiritual trauma or spiritual abuse growing up where scriptures were shaming and uh, you know all the scriptures that could jump out at you as a really unhealthy way to think that's kind of what I was introduced to the way that way and I could just I didn't believe in that I didn't I couldn't you know and so I had to unlearn some things I think and then when as as I was under starting to understand what you know more what addiction is and and also how partners of addicts respond to addiction and sometimes how they become addicts themselves including codependency which is like a, being addicted to a person I think I started to understand and uh, reach my spiritual nature more and as a result, I was able to come back to church activity with a completely fresh perspective. And I think a new, a new lease on who am I connected to? Who am I, who am I dependent on? And gosh, I'd much rather it be God than a person down here on earth who's imperfect, including me, you know, like, so I think that helped a lot to make that transition and that distinction. So I would say I probably got more active in the church after my divorce um, because I had gone through the process of unlearning what wasn't healthy for me. Um, and, and then as far as holding on, so Jeff has mentioned to me that part of the reason why financially he didn't do so well is because he kind of gave in to all those emotions, all, those, all that anxiety, all that depression. And Shame. And instead, what I did is I plowed through, like, um, I was very blessed financially as a single mom to work part-time and take care of my kids part-time and, um, and to be in a position where I wasn't going in the hole every month. Like I was actually able to make that work. Um, and that was a huge blessing, but it took a lot of determination and a lot of work. And I, I did more work than I, I ran faster than I had strength. And for, a, and I don't think I realized I was doing it until my body crashed and my body crashed right around the time that we got married. Um, it's like, it was almost like my body was like, okay, you know, now you have a partner, like just, and I was, I, I was diagnosed with a couple of um, severe stomach problems and stomach problems are closely related to the brain. I felt like I was going crazy. Um, so actually the first part of our marriage was rough. Like, and I was actually a really happy person as a single person. I, I think I developed a really good life. Um, she was a very unhappy person the first two years we were married. But that wasn't you. Um, no, it was no. the illness. But you know, you don't think of getting married, you think of getting married and going off onto a honeymoon in Jamaica or something. You don't think about spending the whole first two years sick. But mm -hmm. I also think that the strength of your love is not tested always in prosperity. It's tested in adversity. And so I had a business I was trying to still get up and running and I was doing everything around the house because she was all she could do pretty much was teach her violin lessons. And that was it. Well, I almost quit my studio and I'm so glad I didn't because I have wonderful violin students. Um, but luckily I'd been teaching long enough. I could kind of autopilot myself through those lessons barely like and then i'd have to crash on the couch again um yeah that was, that was you know so, it's always interesting whatever. how as soon as we come out of the woods on some trials it's like the lord says yeah we're not done we just change trials so here's something new yeah and i think it was i i think we probably needed to have that happen so that we could know we were solid know that we could make it through stuff because we'd both been divorced twice could we hang together in the middle of a real crisis? And that was that. Well, and for him, for, for us, it was, it was me having to recover my body from all the stress of being a single, like super mom. Right. And then for him, it was recovering from the financial losses of being, um, and, you know, emotionally distraught. 
from what he'd lost. So mm -hmm. um, we just- You know, we've talked about it before on this show that, that this idea that, you know, sometimes introducing love into your life is just too early. Like there's some healing you have to do on your own. And then sometimes it's too late. Like, like we need it as part of the healing, you know, like, um, you know, I think sometimes it can be a distraction. You know, if I had dated fresh after, you know, my second divorce, I, I, I don't know how I would have, um, I, I would not have been a good dating partner, you know, not, I, I wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been irritability. It would have been more just kind of depression and just being a kind of a Donnie Downer, you know, but, um, but then too, I think some people wait too long. They're too scared. And at some point I've seen people where they, they had, they weren't perfect. They hadn't figured it all out yet, but they found each other and man, that just sealed the deal. It just seems like that took off, you know, and I'm thinking of two or three couples right now, you know, where at some point we got to pull the trigger, even when we're not 100% ready, you know? Right. I think you need to be to a place of relative peace and be progressing, but not, right. I don't think we should wait to start dating until some sort, we've reached some sort of ideal or you just never get there. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think we did a fair deal of both. We've, we did a yeah. lot of personal work and we also have done a lot of work together as a couple. Right. So clearly your story has a lot of hiccups you know and challenges and adversity and stuff like that but it also has some beautiful twists and turns as well um and so i, I think you can kind of do you feel like that really contributed to the writing of the book you know that we, both the adversity and the the success that you had along the way as far as like dating and courtship and all that yeah i mean we're both family science majors and call it we were family science Isn't majors so in funny? college I thought it was I love a it. degree, but we both have one. But <laughs> that's awesome. The primary basis of what we wrote in our book is our lived experience as much as it is any professional background in it. Um, so we've since uh, certified as life coaches um, together. Mm -hmm. Good. Cool. Yeah, it's a passion. And uh, we've, we've both, I, I've mostly written like a lot of journals. And so for me, that's where my writing background comes in. But Jeff has like a gift. He really does have a gift for writing. And so it, it was really a, a, an honor to write a book with him. Cool. Well, should we tell him how, how it got started? I think yeah, go ahead. more than anything else, the thing that prompted me to, to start the book was, and I was still single at the time, uh, but I, I was on a Facebook mid singles group and it was a group for dating and somebody posted, how long has it been since your last real date? And the first response was 14 years. Oh my God. The next response was like 10 years. Then it was like three years and then seven, you know, and, and then some, there were some people who had dated recently like myself, but a lot of people. And I think you're here on a mid single dating group. And so, but you're not dating. So what is happening, you know, what is happening? Um, why are people not dating? And, and that got me thinking. And so I actually started writing the book and then I'd written portions of five chapters. And I thought, you know, I'm really not ready to do this. I'm not healed enough myself to, to write this book right. You approached it enough to know you weren't. It's right. almost like writing a book about your life when it's not done yet. You're like, I don't really know where we're going on the next chapter just yet. Right. And, and our lives aren't over. I, we, we like to encourage mid singles to know that there is art either. Not, you know, right. We're all in process. Well, but you're talking about a chapter in your life and that did come to, I mean, when you married, that's sort of like a breaking point. It almost seems like then you can kind of look back on it through your experience and then how could we share something about what turned out to be a really successful experience for us yeah. we didn't do that until at least two years into our marriage because i had been so sick like there was just no right it was kind of our that. covid project and i there was a night i couldn't sleep i, I had gotten up and and then i couldn't get back to sleep it and like, it seems like it was april of 20 yeah 20 
So I went down to my office. This and wasn't I, a New Year's Eve thing. Just want to make sure because everything bad always <laughs> happens to you right around that time. Yeah, the magic happens at New Year's. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but I I uh, I thought, man, three o'clock in the morning, legal doing legal work seems heavy. So I just started browsing through my computer and I remembered this book. So I pulled it out and I reread it and I thought, you know, this is pretty good. And so I wrote some more. And the next morning I shared it with Kathy. I don't think she knew. That no, we'd never talked about it. We'd never really he never mentioned it. it to me in the four years. I mean, it was not on my mind really. I just, oh yeah, that, you know. Yeah. But I told her about it the next morning and I said, I think I want to finish this. I think this has possibilities. And she said, I want in. And so I remember that, I was on that couch and I was yep. like, yeah, yeah. Like, let's, let's do this. Do this. Yeah. I feel that mid singles are the most underserved community in the church. I agree. I, I think over mid singles are probably the, say, the most. Up. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> which you know some of your hosts are in that category yes i'm in the ups up up part <laughs> well, me too find mid singles is anyone beyond the possibility of a first marriage in their 20s because oh okay okay that, right so a single okay. see we still count celeste okay Isn't we're that... in there sweet we're, we're real people hey actually everett just just like graduated into the old people too so. oh congratulations Thank I know. You. he's joined us <laughs> well, we probably know some of the same people in the dallas mid-single scene we'll have to talk sometime <laughs> well yeah i don't know I, i'm sure there's some people in their 60s and 70s that are single that would love to still be called mid-singles so you know <laughs> they're all mid-singles to us that's there right you know, awesome. at heart forever my my great uncle remarried when he was ninety two. Oh my god! Oh man! <laughs> How never, was he? never. That gives me hope. <laughs> yeah, I think my grandfather remarried at seventy two, a forty year old, and had his last child. So I I had an uncle. Uh, I was one of his youngest nephews, and I was bouncing him on my belly when I was eighteen. Oh my god! And, and now he's like in his thirties, and I'm. That's so crazy. Like his oldest sibling is in her 90s or something. It's crazy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think he's in his 40s. Yeah. So it's gotta be a Utah thing. <laughs> yeah. You feel this uh this passionate movement to kind of like get back onto your book. How long did it take you to kind of take what you had, compile everything with Kathy, and like finish this whole project? Well, it, it depends on like the first draft. First yeah. draft for four months yeah so you guys plowed through it pretty quick because this is yeah. not a short book this is yeah. not like 75 pages or something i mean we're talking 300 out of us like it just like that summer just yeah that's when i think it's awesome and you're onto something because it's almost like the spirit is just speaking through you like let this flow like you've got a lot of stuff that you have kind of worked through in your own lives that you can now pay back to those people who may need a, a helping hand forward. So, and it can be another beautiful thing that grew out of our own pain. Um, yeah. Well, and I'll tell you what, after the first draft that we had lots of beta readers and then we, we started editing and we had three developmental editors and a final proofreader. And then for, oh gosh, at least six, the last six months, we've been perfecting exactly what word goes where on what page. And that's been a whole project in itself, right? Um, so we're just so excited to finally be getting it out because last year we made the announcement that we would be publishing our book on 11.5, which is the inverse of our anniversary, which is 5.11. And cool. it's going to be an entire year after that that we finally actually make it happen if any of you want to publish a book we have a publishing company called love, love and later years publishing it's lily publishing and we've got a we've got a book from another author that's sort of in process mm -hmm. but i will tell you once you've finished writing the book you're about half done okay so you're you, you're self-publishing then is that what i'm catching on to you guys created your own, your own organization you got your own publishing yeah. our own isbens yeah we yeah we we bought our own numbers so like we will own the rights to it and everything okay cool that's awesome keep more of the profits that way 
Well, um, yeah. <laughs> well, and we found out that uh, we can actually do hardback. So we're going to start with hardback and ebook. And then a few minutes later, we'll bring out the softback and the, um, audio, the book. audio book, which we're doing ourselves. Oh, nice. Oh, fantastic. Uh, and we've got this awesome microphone and we've started reading chapters and. Excellent. That's great. Right. Excellent. Now, are you working to get this in on bookstores or is this specifically going to be an Amazon thing or how will people be now able to be Amazon? Amazon. Okay. It will be in bookstores too. Mm -hmm. Because there's, I mean, I hate to say this because it sounds negative and I don't mean it like that, but there are new mid singles being minted different. every day. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So that's not negative. It's just fact, right? That's I, just factual. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want that. I mean, of course, we wouldn't encourage anyone to get divorced, you know, but. Well, depending on the situation, right? I mean, there are. Some yes. <laughs> if it's abusive right. or something. Yeah, yeah, abuse is not something to mess with. Yep. Yeah, actually, we did a podcast on the divorce decision, and Jeff has a really great three step formula. You can listen to it. It's called The Divorce Decision at Lilypod. Um, we won't go into that right now, but um, yeah, no, of course people do need to be advised sometimes to get divorced, but only they can make that decision. And, uh, you know, of course we wouldn't wish it on anyone because it's hard. Um, in fact, if you're having to make that decision, it's kind of hard either way. So. Yep, it is. For sure. John said before that sometimes you have to, I don't remember your exact words, but it was sometimes you have to um, allow yourself to, to kind of sense or, you know, follow your gut about, because the person who's great on paper may not be your person. And right. Like, or they may not be really healthy uh, on the things that are hard to spot, right. you know, meaning that, you know, they, they're successful, you know, money-wise, or, or they're really physically fit, or they seem really fun or, but when, when push comes to shove, like when you took that trip to Africa or, or in the first few months of your marriage, you find out through adversity that, wow, they, they stay consistent even when it's hard. You know, I think that's the hard thing to find, you know. Right. And, and that's the thing. I mean, is Kathy exactly what I pictured? Well, I, I doubt anyone's spouse is exactly what they might have dreamed up, you know. But even though she's been divorced twice, we got married and she's really devoted. So, you know, I think, I think what I was going to say about that is when Kathy made her decision between me and two other guys, both of those other guys had never been married before. So neither of them had been divorced and they both had military pensions um, and other jobs after that. And so- Yes, if that was my primary and only consideration, <laughs> I would have went another way. So she instead picked the guy that had been divorced twice and was broke. Um, <laughs> I mean, in all reality, you did say that, that was very important to you, right? Like that financial stability was yeah. a huge deal for you. And it still is, but. Um, well, and, and, and she had, you know, her body was about to melt down from all the stress. And so it's like neither one of you were in your <laughs> ideal state. But to me, I mean, that's almost, that's kind of sweet to me. You know, now when the relationship works, you look back and said, we chose each other when we weren't at our best. True. And well, I think that would add a lot of a, a deep sense of loyalty, if you ask me, but. Yeah. We, we say marry a person, not a situation, because situations yeah. can change. Um, and, you know, I mean, those other two guys, I don't know, but I probably make more money than either of them now. Um, so the situation is different. But now, that was a, yeah, but I, I, I knew he had it in him. Like he's, he's brilliant. As you said it, he has a doctorate and he's, he's smart and he's um, really easy to like. So. So he I, had the potential. Oh yeah. So you saw that like the light just needed to be flipped on on that and then things would kind of go a different direction, but yeah. <laughs> And, once I well, get... and I, I also ask myself how much of, you know, I look at some couples because I work with couples. I'm a therapist. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll see these people with great potential and they're married to someone who's just really toxic. And I'll just say to myself, what could that guy or that woman accomplish 
with someone supportive. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, it's so distracting. It's so soul sucking to be in a relationship like that. And it's, it's like, it cripples us, you know, it it really does. It, It cripples us from reaching our full potential, not just, you know, money wise or fitness wise or whatever, but sometimes just spiritually, emotionally. And that's why intentional courtship is so important. So that you yeah, I love that one who supports your best self. Good segue. I like that. So <laughs> let's uh, let's get into the book a little bit. Okay. Sure. Um, I love. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your stories. I love kind of that you guys have walked this walk and hearing your stories. You know, and I've had a chance to go through and read this, so I've you know, I kind of know some of the things that you guys are talking about already, but um, to me, what I take away when I'm going through this is like, okay, I find myself sitting there going, "Uh uh-huh. Yep. Yep. I've been there. Like, I understand exactly what you're talking about. So, and I value that way more than somebody who has never been divorced, who's going to lecture me on holding to the rod and just sticking it out and the blessings are going to come yada yada right like the sunday school answers that i know i know right like i know what you're going to tell me but i want to know and honestly for me this is like this is like why the savior is so awesome to me because he walked that walk right like I, there's nothing i can't take to him that he hasn't felt and so when i go through something it is much more valuable to me when i know somebody else has been in those shoes that i've kind of walked in before too yeah. so George McDonald said, we read to know that we are not alone. And I think, I think we had that idea in mind when we wrote the book to think, look, we want this to help restore hope to the hopeless. We want it to be like a big warm blanket that lets people know and understand that no matter how low you are right now, no matter how low you've sunk, you know, it's, it's not beyond you and God to get to a much better place and have a beautiful life. Absolutely. Yeah. In a way, it's both good messages. One, it's a, it's a message of hope. It's a, it's a message that it is kind of like the, the answers the gospel gives about having faith and about keep trying and that kind of thing. But I think it's matched with some practical ways of going about that. And, um, and you need both really. You know, if it's all practical, but there's not a lot of hope, it's like this emotionless, you know, laundry list of things to do. But if you, you know, have, you know, all hope and, and no, no advice on how to actually put that into action, it becomes kind of pie in the sky and Pollyanna. And, yeah. uh, but what do I do? You know, so. Yeah, I mean, this sounds kind of cheesy, I guess, and I thought it when I was writing it, but I actually wrote a model phone call between a guy calling a girl to ask her for a date. Um, this is how ha- roughly how it'll go, and you know, this is what you should <laughs> what you should think about, and you know how you should approach it. In the case reason, anyone needs help with that, the reason that I did that is because there's all kinds of stuff out there that's very high-minded about just trust in the Lord and, you know, this way you're talking about, but it doesn't give, you know, it doesn't tell somebody when he's nervous out of his mind um, and sees this beautiful girl and wants to talk to her, you know, how do you get started? Um, Right. So we wanted to make it, I mean, high-minded, but also relatable and Mm -hmm. give people basic information about you know, okay, what do you do now with texting now? Because a lot of mid-singles came, you know, came of age originally when we didn't have cell phones. And now their cell phones play a big role in dating. So there's stuff like that. in. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think you need to write a conversation when one of them has not healed completely and is emotionally not in a good place, <laughs> just to know when to hang up and say, hey, it's okay. Um, maybe I'll talk to you down the road, you know, like, <laughs> what does it look like when it doesn't go well, you know? That's a good idea. We so. do podcasts for that. <laughs> right. <laughs> we talked about, uh, yeah, emotional baggage and, you know, how Trauma. to, yeah. And I think John being a therapist, of course, would know this more than we do, but 
I think every mid single virtually that I've gotten to know well during my mid single years had some trauma. And oh, yeah. I think some there's a misconception out there that trauma is a huge car accident or some, you know, bullets whizzing by your head during a battle. It can be those things, but often yeah. it is like, well, every time I went to kiss my wife for 10 years, she turned her head to avoid it. You know, and it could really be the yep. traumas all add up together to do serious. I'm glad you said that because seriously like officially the the definition of trauma has changed in the last decade to include a lot of those things and it reminded me of the movie and i don't know if anybody's seen the movie um is it called concussion anyway will smith, it, anyway, will smith it, where he plays the doctor that discovers that these oh, yeah. nfl football players are being brain damaged i've seen it the, yeah and um and what he found out it was, they, they could never find it on brain scans because what it was, was these tiny little blood vessel breaks throughout the brain, but they don't show up as one giant head injury. They're like these microscopic head injuries. Right. But he said, when you add them up from Pop Warner football through high school, through college, through NF, you know, 10 years of the NFL, you know, you got 30 years of these little micro uh, brain injuries and they add up to one giant brain injury. And I think of that too with, you know, trauma. Right. In that we think of trauma, like I heard somebody stabbing my mom to death in the next room or something like, okay, yeah, who, who wouldn't be traumatized by that? But what about those little slights, like you said, you know, just not being, not getting a kiss or, having someone ignore you or having someone control you or you know and when you add up all those day after day those little injuries yeah people get to where they they have all the signs of ptsd so and i was in that camp i can tell you i mean i've had emdr too um that yeah does that's huge a lot. like um, it does a lot individually rather than doing marriage therapy we did emdr for ourselves and all and some of the things that we couldn't talk about when we were first married just without like totally freaking out just it cleared up it just went away so i've done a little bit of emdr but just for those in the audience that may not know what that is why don't you tell us a little bit about emdr i uh, yeah and i can i can do john too yeah eye movement reprocessing go ahead you can uh yeah i always mix up the um uh, eye movement reprocessing okay desensitization or reprocessing That's yeah desensitization yeah yeah and so what it is basically we have a bilateral brain and it's using whenever we uh alternate back and forth in, in our brain it opens us up basically it gives us the ability to to access um memory better and to express it better um and so really what it's that i almost think of it almost like getting a massage before a chiropractic treatment you know it's almost like it it opens your mind to being able to to benefit from the therapy better well, and it releases trauma it's and it, it does it releases the trauma you know and whether you can express it or not it allows your brain to let it go and so they're trained to not only do the bilateral movement, but also how to revisit traumatic events. And they usually start with less traumatic stuff, you know, just with kind of small things and then work their way to where we're talking about some of the hardest things I've ever had to go through. And, and I've noticed it too, both I, I've been a client that's received it and I've actually watched it done and worked with clients who've had it done. And yeah, it's, it's, it, it's amazing how much it just sort of unplugs your mind from that automatic traumatic you know feedback loop basically yeah i i remember one moment during emdr i don't know why this is the one i remember the most but the therapist um said something as if she was my mother we were talking about something in my childhood and she said what did you need your mother to tell you and I gave her a rough idea and so she repeated it back and I said I can't imagine my mother ever saying that 
And she said, that's right. Your mother had her own issues and she couldn't say that. So we're redoing it. Yeah, exactly. And, and your brain at that point is open to that suggestion. Right. You know, it, it's like hypnosis in some sense, but it's different. It's a different way of accessing it, you know? So I use mindfulness-based approaches. And so I, tr I help people learn, you know, like you mentioned um, radical acceptance earlier. Right. So that's one of the eight skills that I teach. And, and so when we get really good at those, that can kind of rewire the brain to perceive trauma differently. And, my, and that's exciting. Mindfulness, particularly meditation, did a great deal for me as well. And I'm right. meditating now. I, I just take the skills that, my, that, that meditation teaches you through practice. I just teach them to people directly. Yeah. And so, so they learn them. Uh, it's almost like, here's why meditation works. Here's eight reasons it works. Let's learn the eight reasons. But meditation will always helps for sure. One other thing I want to say about trauma to the whole group, I guess, is um, my the, the term I probably like least that gets thrown around the mid singles community is red flags. Oh, this was a real red flag or that was a real red flag. And what it it, it may be a red flag, but it also may be um, a trigger for trauma. And, you, and you're being triggered by something that's really totally innocuous. But to you, it's a sign that something is gonna blow up later. And I think your brain wants to go there, particularly if you've experienced trauma. It wants to protect mm -hmm. any possible, you know, bad thing that could come into your life. And so- So that's a big thing that gets in the way of, of intentional courtship is this- Over-interpreting. Overinterpreting, overprotection. Over right. And, and I think so if you start- Hypervigilance. If you start to feel panicky in a relationship, and I, in our book, I talk about a time I almost dumped Kathy early on because <laughs> she moved the time of a date that we had. You know, and I just took it as- How this, dare you, madam? You no. Know, you know what? But that's total, double mustard on that hot dog. Forget it. Is. And I took it as a total rejection and she called and asked me out the next day. If I had not come to my senses before all that happened, I probably would it would have been a self fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. You know right. what, Jeff? So, like, my favorite chapter in the book was the fear chapter, and that's where you were talking about that. How you were a like your self talk would almost sabotage yourself. Right. And so, why don't you give us a little rundown of that? Because I thought that was a, a wonderful chapter of the experience or the. Or just, just fear in general. I think you guys had a really good grasp. Probably more the concept. The just... reality that we all kind of like harbor ourselves in the fear pocket so we don't get hurt. And so we have to kind of find our way out of that realm so that we are like, okay, I can be, a, I can put myself out there and I can risk some things. So, yeah, I think the number one thing that holds people back from dating as mid singles is fear. Um, now, there's all kinds of excuses that we give. Well, I'm really busy with my kids. I'm really, you know, th there's a whole long list of things people say. And I, it's not mine to second guess other people's motives, but I know there's a lot of fear behind that in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it's understandable. If you've been hurt before, you're going to feel that fear coming up. One thing I would say to you is, don't mistake that for the Holy Ghost. Um, the Lord hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And fear is not a sound mind either. Um, fear is, is an irrational mind. And that can be very much associated with trauma. And so mm -hmm. I think when you're, when you're making a decision, even if it's a decision to end a relationship, make it from a place of peace. Make sure you've taken enough time after an incident to get some perspective, to breathe through it, and, and that you're feeling peaceful inside about the decision before you, because your brain will tell you, I've got to end this now. I've got to get out of this now. And that's rarely ever true. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's both what happens to us and how we interpret it. That, that's what leads to the decisions we make. And I, and I hear what you're saying, Jeff, is basically make sure 
if, it, if you're going to call it a red flag, make sure it's actually their behavior that's toxic and not you sort of projecting that onto them because you've been hurt by something similar. You know, I've, I've been in relationships where I felt like I was only like 10 or 20% of the man that hurt them, but they were looking at me like I was 80% of the man that hurt them. And, and it was like, and it's like, I, I don't think I'm being totally like him, you know, I'm just disagreeing or so, you know, and then next thing you know, it's like trauma response, you, you know, you, you're controlling, you're, you're angry, you're, you know, and it's like, whoa, I don't think I'm super angry right now, you know, I, and you can, and once you sense that, then that sort of becomes a red flag for me, because I'm kind of like thinking, I think I'm pretty calm right now. And, and they're, they're feeling like I'm ready to, you know, punch them in the face or something. And it's just like, you know, I, I really am not there, you know, and so, um, yeah, I, I think one, one of the main ways we know we're healed is that I don't add anything to what I'm seeing in them, you know, just let them be what they are, good or bad. Right. That's good. And I think just like you said a minute ago, and I wrote this very thing in the book, look at the behavior itself, not what you think it might signal. Right. Like if somebody explodes at the waiter because their order's wrong at a restaurant, that might be something to be concerned about and think, well, they've got a bad temper. But the fact that they spoke one little, you know, sort of angry word and got over it, is not necessarily a red flag that they're in anger at. Exactly. Um, the perspective, I guess, you know, just, you know, how, you know, it, it's almost like if there's any, like it's the smallest sign of what hurt me once, right. I treat it like it's a hundred percent that. And it's just like, listen, people are human. You know, people get upset, people get down on themselves, people feel overwhelmed but that doesn't mean they're going to freak out like your ex did or that they're going to, you know, lose control or anything like that. Right. And, and we both had a lot of sensitivities when we were dating and first married too. And we still do um, less than we used to, but I can tell you um, one thing that makes a huge difference is that we both understand this enough to know when we're flooded. And um, I don't know if you've seen this research, but John and Julie Gottman say that they, they actually hooked people up to electrodes and stuff yep. and, and watched them have conversations with their spouse about sensitive issues. And when anybody's heart rate got over 100 beats per minute, there was a 0% chance that after that threshold that they were gonna solve it. Um, and so- yeah. The moral of the story, of course, is if you're flooded, do not talk. Don't talk. Don't talk. And I agree. A to the man. We have a, a, a rule Seriously. in our marriage that if one of us calls time out, it ceases for at least 20 minutes and usually not more than a few hours. So we, we try to. And none of that give, give you a piece of my mind and then say we're not talking. Yeah, no last word. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and and that is that has because you know you can get to a point where you're so flooded and so frustrated you're saying things that people are going to remember and are going to do damage for a long time and we don't let it get to that point with us because the other thing the Gottmans figured out is that they would tell people uh, and it wasn't even true but they would say oh we're having technical difficulties you need to stop for a minute so they would stop they would give their their equip, you know, their heart rates a chance to go down, and when they were calm, many of them could solve the problem. Like, mm -hmm. in minutes. like yeah, and and right. we the same thing. If if things start to get really tense, we call time out. We come back together in twenty minutes or an hour, and wow, you know, five minutes and we're done. That was easy. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to like when it comes to communication and when you're in an argument or whatever, I think it's important to like, and this is stated in the, the chat as well, is that if you ask questions to try to understand the other person's point of view, it's always a better route to ask questions than assume what you think they're thinking or assume what you think they mean by it or whatever. Because once you project, oh, you're saying this because of that, 
you know, that puts them on the defense. And they're like, that's not at all what I was saying. If you would have asked for clarification, you would have known that. So I think asking and really trying to understand where they're coming from um, Mm -hmm. before you try to give your reply or whatever is always a a good route to take. Yeah, and assuming good intent while you're doing that. Yeah. Uh, you assume that they have a good reason for feeling the way they do, even if it's different than you. Right. Mm-hmm. I think also express just expressing how you feel without presuming that means it's true. Right. You know, right. say, hey, that kind of hurt when you said that. I, you know, I felt like you were kind of dismissing what I said, you know, and then they can come back. Oh, no, no, no. Like, I, I don't want to dismiss what you said. Like, I was just expressing what I felt. It's like, well, good. Thanks for clarifying that for me. Well, and then um, once they say that, let them be the master of their own words. Don't right. Say, oh, no, I remember exactly how you said it. You said it this way. And this is what it meant. There are a few things more narcissistic than telling people how they feel and what they think. <laughs> That's right. So, oh, somebody <laughs> clarifies, no, I meant it this way. You got to accept You got to take them for their word. Like why, like if you're in that relationship, you've got to have trust. And if they're saying, mm-hmm. no, that is not how I meant it. I meant it this way. Even if you perceived it completely different like yeah you got to accept it for right and especially if they admit it and they eat crow yeah praise the lord man let them do it and and why would i rub that in you know it's just like well thank you for being open about it you know i appreciate that so i think it's even okay to respond well i really felt yeah even though you didn't mean it that way it's still hurting inside you know? Yeah, and then they can reassure, and yeah. you know, yeah. and I actually saw you, you do, I saw you two do something really healthy earlier. By the way, when <laughs> Kathy was sharing her story, I could tell he kind of got the feeling like, well, I don't even think he got the feeling. Kathy was worried that Jeff took something to mean that he had done something wrong, and you actually turned to him and said. That wasn't your fault, by the way. Like it was about when you were sick early in the marriage. And I just thought that's that's very sweet. That like that's how it should be. Almost like I'm always in the back of my mind is how could this affect my partner? You know, and even though they may not have even expressed hurt over it, could I just look to them and reassure them, you know, that hey, you know, that was because I was sick. It wasn't your fault, you know. And I had a trauma response the other day. I knew it was ridiculous, but I was falling uncontrollably and Jeff just put his arms around me you know I mean he could have said you're being irrational and ridiculous and that could have been true but oops wouldn't have been helpful (laughs) our relationship so I think what I did is just ask what are you afraid of yeah and I was able to tell him because it was Mm -hmm. I had brought up like just um something an interaction had brought up a a trigger for me yeah because there was a question tell me what you're feeling Tell me what you're afraid of. Like, oh, I forgot. I'm also thankful I found bottles at DI. They're so much cheaper. (laughs) Um, That is unrelated to the discussion, you know. Uh, (laughs) Just kind of as a a side note, if you're in the audience, please keep yourself muted and your camera off just till we get to a spot where we call in the audience. So thank you. All right. But now we know about DI bottles. Yes. Uh, 50 cents a piece. There you go. Yep. So one thing I want to say, you know who Jennifer Finlayson Fife is. Yeah. Um, We had her on our podcast. Some of you may have heard it. Um, And she talked mostly about sexuality and being a celibate mid single and how you prepare for a better relationship in your future marriage. And it was a great, great interview. But one thing she said that I repeated a lot to to people is, uh, you know, the the statistics on second and third marriages aren't great. Um, And she said that you have to be, that, that some people go through a marriage that's hard and then they're very self reflective and they really put some intention into figuring out how to show up better in a future marriage and and do it differently. And I think very often we're prone to bagging on our exes and you know seeking people to listen to us about it. And looking for, for people that aren't like our former spouse. 
and that that's the way it's going to work out better. But yeah, you know, we're, you know right. I'm going to marry someone better because I could have done it fine if my spouse hadn't been such a jerk. And I sell them for a quarter a bottle. <laughs> and uh, who is that? It's, it's I got her muted. We're all right. <laughs> uh, anyway, but but yeah, I mean, I think I think um, yeah, in the beginning, maybe you have to process that way. But I think there comes a point when it's important to say, all right, I can't control what happened in my former marriage, but I can understand my own role in it. I can, you know, I can figure out how I want to show up next time and be really intentional about that. And I think that's a, a huge realization. And I think it gives you your best chance. Well, and I think what you were getting to is that she said what you really want to look for is someone who looks at themselves and is reflective. Right. Um, because really that you can work with. And then be that kind of person yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, what do they say that 90% of an apology should be changed behavior? You know, that I'd rather have just a simple I'm sorry and then I never see it again than have like a long drawn out I'm so sorry and, you know, Bring give me all the reasons and everything and then it keeps showing up, you know, and I mean, people are going to, you know, go back and, and make mistakes here and there, but I, you can tell when someone's really making an effort to correct something in their life. You, you may not never see it again, but you you see it a lot. You can tell there's a significant difference, right. you know, and that matters, you know, matters right. more than words in a way. Yeah, for sure. I, I think so too. Well, and it's it's been a really good for our marriage to do the things that we teach our clients in coaching. And that is, you know, thought work, um, examining what we're thinking and if it's, if it's in our best interest to continue thinking it because they're all, it's all optional. It's all, you know, a choice we make. I mean, we might not control, obviously we don't control what pops into our mind, but we do decide what we focus on. We decide what we um, tune into and- um, Something and just, in their life. You, you may not never see it Sorry, we had a little feedback loop there. I know, I'm like, I'm not sure who that was. <laughs> I think that was Facebook coming in on our live oh, feed. My apologies, I just turned it off. Oh, we're still live on Facebook. I just had to shut it down. And this okay. popped back up for some reason. I'm not sure why. Okay. okay. <laughs> I felt I like I was me this time. Boo there for a second. Yeah. So um, any other feedback or anything else you want to talk about from the book? Yeah, you know, one of the things um, that uh, I am most impressed with with this book, for anybody who's considering, um, we've talked about this a million times on this show. <clears throat> and one of the reasons why a lot of people kind of go through this repeated cycle of divorce, marriage, divorce, marriage, over and over and over again, is that there is a foundational piece within us, this trauma that we've been talking about, that needs to be addressed probably before we move on to anything else. And mm -hmm. I love that your book is organized in a way of, I don't know if you guys will allow me to like say the different parts, right? Yeah, no, still, yeah, okay. Sure. okay, so you start off by laying a foundation, right? And then you get into like, all right, now that we've got like, we're working on some of overcoming these fears and fixing these traumas and things then you get into dating and then you get into pairing up. It's sort of like this progression, right? Right. All too often in people who haven't been on this path, they're like, well, are you dating anybody? Like go out there and date some people. Like, well, look, okay. I'm glad that you've been in this 35 year long marriage. You've never had to like recycle back into this group, but you don't just like get off the horse and jump right back on again. Right. Like, there are some steps to getting ready again and overcoming those things. And your book outlined that beautifully. Thank so you. thank you very much for actually like taking the time and showcasing that, hey, guys, there's a process to this. Don't just jump in to heal that wound that you're feeling right now. Because yeah. getting into another marriage doesn't heal the wound. It just masks it. Right. Yeah, and if you're wanting to get married to prove something to your former spouse 
you're still, I think it's hard to move on to a new love really when you're yeah. still embroiled in, in the battles of another relationship. And so, yeah, heal that first. I, I can tell you, you know, I mean, I'm not proud of it, but I really hated my former wife for a while. I, you know, I wanted nothing good for her. And uh, it was a, a little bit like the talk Elder Bednar gave in conference this last time where he talked about the divorced woman that wanted justice and accountability for her former husband. And when she realized that Christ had paid for his sins, she thought, well, why should the price have to be paid twice? And she was able to let it go. And I can say, you know, my former wife and I are friends now. We're not, you know, close friends. We don't talk all the time, but. Um, You're not hanging out and going to the movies together or something. No, but I mean, there have been <laughs> one time uh, she was confiding in me about something. And I said, do you, do you think maybe you jumped right into another relationship too soon after we got divorced. And she said, yeah, I thought that, um, you know, and it was just a little moment, but um, I, uh, you know, I would much rather have her peaceful toward me and me peaceful toward her than. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the truth is, is if you, if you're bitter or if you're angry or if you're causing contention, with your ex, it's not going to really hurt them. I mean, I guess it could, but it's it's just you carrying on the same hurt and anger that is just going to affect your life. And it will affect, if you have children, it'll affect their lives as well. So yeah, I think our know, kids are, are really, yeah. they're really sensitive to that. They are. And so, you and know, they, like- And they can even pick up on energies, not even just words. Or they can feel like presence when they're in the room and stuff. Like me and my ex, we are- amicable like I go to his house for dinner I took him to the airport the other day and dropped him off like we try to do things that maybe we're not 100% comfortable with but we do it to be nice and kind and so that our kids feel like neither of their parents are evil and that they're both still good people they aren't mm -hmm. together anymore for purposes but they're still good people and so I think that's really important is like let it go it's not hurting anybody but yourself and the kids. So just, just kind of get past it. It's easier said than done, but you know, like it just is a healthier way of dealing with it. If you keep it going, it's just going to cause more issues. Right. I know it, it's really natural to feel that wanting revenge or whatever. You know, we can say we want justice and accountability, but really we want revenge. Um, but I, I do think we get to a point where we've got to find our shalom. Um, Let it go. And, and, you know, I, my former wife and I started to parent our youngest a lot better when we started, we, we could put everything behind us and not, mm -hmm. you know, not have what's happening with him be about who's winning. Right. Jeff, as right. an attorney yourself, do you know who James R. Rasband is? Yes. Okay. I, I would figure you did, but um, have you heard his talk uh, called, I believe it's Faith to Forgive Grievous Harms? I don't think so. It's a BYU talk. That would be fantastic. It's essentially like, hey, when somebody has, and he kind of gives it from a lawyer's perspective at the beginning, and he kind of gives some analogies along those lines. Um, but when somebody has hurt us tremendously, even if they're not repentant, right? Because let's face it, not everybody gets to a point of being amicable with their ex. Sometimes their ex is just, you know, off and doing their own thing and they're about their own business. So how do we let that go and how do we heal from that and forgive them and move on from that? And having that faith to forgive those grievous harms it's fantastic. So it's a BYU talk. It's on BYU's website. Um, if you get a yeah, chance, great. yeah, look for James R. Rasband in the BYU sections and it'll be there. Faith to Forgive Grievous Harms or Grievous Sins. Um, excellent. I want to say harms, but yeah. I'll tell you something that was kind of brought that home to me, uh, Everett. When Kathy and I were, were engaged and I was submitting my paperwork so we could be sealed and get my sealing clearance. Um, 
I remember, you know, it asks you to write out the circumstances of your divorce on the form. And I didn't want to. I, I remember telling the bishop, you know, I'm having a hard time with this because I really had to get to a point where it no longer matters who was at fault. And I feel like this question is asking me to defend myself. And I don't want to defend myself. You know, he said, why don't you write that? Um, so that was a big part of what I wrote is I, I'm really uncomfortable with this question because I've forgiven her. I don't, you know, I realized that it wasn't all her fault. I had my issues too, and it doesn't really matter who was at fault anymore. And that was a big part of what I wrote on my, on my ceiling clearance form. And it, it went through, it actually went through lightning really quick. Yeah. Um, but uh, I remember feeling that way and thinking, yeah, I must be, have healed, done a lot of healing because at first I would have unloaded in that letter, you know? Yeah. You know, something to remember about that, because I think some of us either have gone through that or will. I mean, these letters are kept. I mean, they're, they're, they're kept forever, man. They, the, uh, it's a record. It's like a, it's almost like family history in a way, you know? And I, and when I knew that, when I wrote my letter, I, I remember just saying, I do not want anyone to read this someday and think to themselves, what a bitter little dude, you know what I mean? Like, what a, what a pissy little guy, you know? And, and so I just, I, I tried to get to the, you know, the best place I could get and write it like with love and forgiveness and that kind of thing. And you know what I found was it actually healed me a lot. It actually took me to the next level of where I really felt that stuff. And I really didn't hold any animosity. And so I, I really liked that process, but I can see how it could actually make you bitter if, if, if you're not careful. So I, I actually contacted my former wives during the process as well and said, I don't want this to come out of left field. You'll be getting a letter from the, you know, from the bishop about that will ask you to submit something. And, and uh, I, I think that actually did a lot. So they didn't just get shocked by, you know, getting that in the mail and they hadn't heard anything from me. Right. I, I think that's, I like that idea. You know, I think a lot of us have contemplated, you know, I, I mean, I'm going to have to do that someday with my second marriage. And, and uh, I, I know that I would, rather hear in advance, you know, rather than just get an email from a bishop. Um, you know, I'd rather somebody just say, hey, listen, you know, I'm going to move on in this way, you know, and, uh, you know, I just wanted to give you a heads up so you weren't surprised. You know? Yeah, I think that's a kind and respectful way to handle it, I think. And my former wife gave me a wedding gift, so. Oh, <laughs> oh that's awesome. Very awesome. That's great. Okay, well, we're just about to open up for per audience participation. I know we're toward the end, but do you guys mind if we bring in people to ask questions or make comments? Oh, that sounds I think great. I just wanted to, to comment really quick that, you know, I think that we're all being made into better spouses through all the experiences we're having. Um, I know we're I better agree. spouses for each other than we ever could have been if we'd met earlier in life. We've had this conversation many times. Um, we are definitely a better match, I think, with what we've experienced. So... Anyway, yeah, bring on the questions. All right. Okay. Our first person is David. Come on, David. <laughs> if you do want to make a comment or a question, just raise your hand and we'll do it in order. Hi, David. And I'll be I'll be quick with this, but I also think having lost everything the way I talked about earlier in this program, I appreciate everything I have so much more. Mm -hmm. Um I appreciate my marriage, my great job, my great stepkids, my great kids. And if I hadn't lost all of that at one point, like Job, I took it so much for granted before. Before it was just a thing that you did. It was just something everybody did. They get all up, they got married, they got jobs, they did, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I wanted to touch on because, yeah. you know, as I was listening to what you were saying, to me, it was about timing. You know, there was a purpose for each experience that you had. You know, I have had very difficult experiences in my life. And how do you feel like God's timing was 
important in your love story because i mean i love your love story it is incredible i just like as i was listening to i just i felt it right here you know how was god's timing important in your story well you know i didn't meet him for an, a year after i got had my second divorce and for me that <clears throat> felt like an eternity because if you'll remember i did not know, know how to be alone so I dated a lot of people, but no one was fitting like the way I wanted it to. I mean, I wanted to be married. Um, I just, I just wanted to be married again. And I thought that it should be working faster. And um, so for me, it was the waiting uh, was part of the timing. And then once we met, we weren't ready. Like I, I wasn't emotionally ready and he wasn't financially ready um or emotionally yeah we were both still working through things and so we met but i think it was good for us to have known each other during that time that we were still kind of working through our own issues um so we could grow that friendship um, where we weren't dating um so i guess that's what how i would say timing worked for me was just the it took longer than i wanted it to yeah, when we were just friends for that year, though, there were things we did that I think we connected over personal development, um, and we shared our journeys a lot. So we had deep conversations about things we'd learned. We read the Book of Mormon together, and we have hundreds of pages of notes that we sent back and forth from that. Um, so there was a lot we did that built our relationship. I think even we though... learned through that we have a lot in common with how we see the gospel and how we... Right. Like, I thought it was interesting in your book that you guys stated, I don't know if you stated you all did it or that you suggested people like actually prayed together about if you were right for each other and to move forward. I thought that was very intriguing. I was like, that's an interesting concept. I mean, I, I don't know. Pray together to get through difficult <laughs> issues. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I mean, I remember there was a night um, when, and Kathy can remember this too. We were we were discussing some things that were involved around the time of our breakup and I was still super sensitive about it. I think she was to some degree too. And tension would build and Kathy would, this is after I'd written her the letter and everything. We were trying to, we were kind of working together. through their original breakup and like, okay, how are we going to become a couple again after your friendship, you know? All yeah, kind of it's complicated. It had a few moments of pretty serious tension, and each time Kathy would say, "We we should pray and shift this." I love that. And so we would pray together, and it would shift. We would become peaceful. The relationship would start to take prominence over whatever it was that was in the way, and we probably prayed together five times that night. And, we had lots of tricky stuff to discuss. But I remember her way of handling that um, made a huge impression. Yeah, because it's not about you. It's about, it, it's more than just about you. It's, and I it's love a, that. Yeah, it's a humble act. It's an act to say, you know what, we're going to put our feelings or ideas or thoughts aside and come together and right. ask the Lord about our future. I thought yeah i think it's an it's a great concept so. well and i'm struck by the emotion at the end of that mm -hmm. jeff that i think yep. um what what we find in therapy with couples is the greatest bonding experiences aren't intellectual alone yep. they're emotional you know and the question i i think one of the biggest green flags you can ever find is do they really bring out like the heartfelt emotion in me you know, do, do they really, do I feel like they recon, like I, I feel more connected to God and to myself in when I'm around this person, you know? And to me, if I can answer that question, yes, that doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to marry them, but I don't, that helps get rid of all, a lot of that fear. You know what I mean? At least I know I'm safe with them, you know, and whether that turns into a marriage or not, I don't know, but it's at least a friendship for, for, for real. So. Yeah. And I think it's important along those lines and we kind of talked about this before, but we've all got the trauma. And so we might like to think, well, I don't have any, it's everybody else, or it was my former spouse. 
but I want to be with someone who doesn't have any triggers. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Nope. <laughs> That's Not someone who's looking for the perfect person. And if you're looking for the perfect person, you're always going to be let down and you're just never going to find happiness. I think it's important, like, and I, and you guys spoke about that in your book about you can't be searching for perfection and that, um, it it's, you got to give someone space to grow and, and to become their best self. So, I yeah, I think you're looking for someone you can create a safe space with when you are triggered as opposed to somebody that will never trigger you or that you won't ever trigger because that's not going to happen well and to go back to your point everybody's got their triggers right you also want to be with somebody whose triggers don't like feed onto yours so somehow your triggers match up in a good way well, that our triggers like... can sometimes match up in terrible ways but, <laughs> but we know who they are and we're willing to i mean because yes yeah, sometimes we have opposing triggers so like something that really triggers him is the opposite for me and then that, that can be a challenge but i mean it's not I guess what I'm saying is I don't think you necessarily have to have none of the, that. I think it's more that you need to be introspective and be willing to see your part and be willing to work past them. And uh, I want to just clarify on the prayer thing. We didn't, I don't think we ever prayed together to know if we should get married. I think we prayed together more. Well, we did in the temple, I think. Yeah, when we were close to like, kind actually. Of silently, but... I think that was more when we kind of already made the decision you know, and that we look wouldn't. just for confirmation kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, you know, me and my little notes, I got my little notes here and it says, um, it is advisable to pray together as a couple and ask that guidance be given regarding your future. So, yeah, I mean, that could be in the temple that can be you over a dinner. I don't know. Like, I mean, I guess it's not like right before bed, we're going to pray. That's not probably an opportune time, but, <laughs> um, you know, but yeah. And, then, find and, you yeah and then we'll make out intentional. Yeah, right. yeah on finding moments to find those moments to, you know, to pray and to kind of have that third person come in and, and give some guidance. Yeah, and I'm certainly not against that. I just wanted to clarify that as, well, as, as far as I remember our own prayers, it was mostly asking God for help for us to work through things. Right. But yeah, we were certainly prayerful when like we that. felt like we should be, you know, with each other. And I, I think it's an, an individual choice. Have you ever... Um read or heard uh sister nelson current nelson sister wendy nelson's uh experience when she went and prayed about whether or not to marry president nelson oh it's in our book okay oh okay you must have Maybe heard that's it. where i read it so okay i'm just sitting here thinking i know i've read that recently like duh okay so for those in the audience that haven't experienced it why don't you tell us a little bit about that because i think that is pretty much exactly kind of along the lines of what you guys are talking about here i mean she she almost had like an Enos experience, right? Like I'm just gonna go out for a while and I've got to like tap into this, find out what the Lord's telling me because there's a 26 year age gap there. That's a huge gap. She's younger than his oldest child, which is, you know, hey mom, how's it going? Like, I'm still older, older than you. It's a little bit like John's situation and his bouncing his niece on his stomach, right? Like that's, it's just <laughs> the ages don't match up. But in the eternities, little uncle like, Matt stuff matters, right? Well, in her initial gut reaction, Sister Wendy Nelson's was, no, <laughs> you know, there's too big of an age gap. He's still grieving his ex, not his ex-wife, but his late His deceased wife. wife. Yeah. yeah, and and she was like, we're too different. You know, it's just, it would never work. But she she went up into the mountains and she prayed about it. And I think she spent a couple of days there. Um, but she said that God told her in what was it, six different ways or something what the possibilities were for the future. And, and you know, she came, came down feeling like the Lord wanted her to explore this with this much older apostle. And they've been married, what, at least a decade. 16 years. Well, 16 years yeah, and, and look, at, look at the incredible contribution she's made yeah to the work and can you imagine the adventure she's been on yeah during that time holy moly yeah yeah i think she's where she she was supposed to be and and so i yeah i think that's profound and we joke about the 12 year age difference between us and you know 
I joke that she wasn't old enough for me to baptize when I went on my mission and things like that. <laughs> 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 the yeah, as long, as long as you're not that old <laughs> it's actually we're exactly 11 years and 11 months apart and we found this out day. jeff discovered this a few days after we set our our wedding date of may 11th that's true wow. oh wow my son's birthday wow <laughs> it's our favorite number and it's an awesome number because one plus one um is 11 is, is 11 <laughs> <laughs> so we're like we're we're more you know we're worth greater than the sum of our parts so write this down when this show is over <laughs> go look up dnc 111 11 okay <laughs> and it, it's going to be one of your new favorite scriptures <laughs> no it's a beautiful it's a beautiful scripture it actually is reminiscent of a new testament scripture but anyway i wrote it down we will do it. okay good Fantastic. Do we have anybody else in the audience with any other comments? We always kind of get this, people get quiet, like right at that moment. The chatter stops and gets quiet in the chat. Oh, and Sharon, come on. They get shy. Thanks for your question, David, by the way. Yeah, we'd love to hear your questions or comments or whatever you want to say. You know, just uh, going back to your comment about how all the experiences you guys went through and the hardships really kind of made what you have now feel that much sweeter. I mean, I've always thought about that kind of old farmer analogy where you've got, you know, the, how do they put it? Like the, the old recliner feels so much better after a hard day's work than if you haven't done any work at all. Like when you've been through all that stuff and you have that moment of like, okay, now this is supposed to be good. It feels even sweeter having known like we, we kind of like had to struggle through this. And I think that's kind of a universal truth. This is maybe a little bit of the gospel according to Everett, but um, I've often thought about like Solomon, right? Like he wanted to be wise. And I think those things all come with a price, right? So I would be willing to bet if we had the full book of Solomon and all of his life, that there was a lot of things that led up to him learning to be wise. It wasn't just like, boom, there you go. You get to be wise. It's sort of like the Lord says, you want to be wise? Okay, we'll get you some experience here and that'll wisen you up, right? Right. So that's- And I it took a while for him to get stupid too. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know? Yep. Well, I mean, kind of went- Either to one happened overnight, right? Yeah. I think so, to your first point, the, you know, the idea that um, you can appreciate things more after you've been through- some crap. Um, I think gratitude really is the key to happiness and not in some, you know, just mystical scriptural sense. I mean, it is that too, but, but I think gratitude is the key to happiness because you can only enjoy something, anything you have to, at, at the level at which you appreciate it. Um, you know, if you're taking it for granted, you're not really enjoying it. And I, I think I took my life way for granted, like I said, before I lost everything. Yeah. And having lost everything twice, um, I think, um, you know, man, every time I get behind the wheel of my car, I think how great it is to have a reliable car that is fun to drive and gets me where I need to go. And, you know, you talked about like cuddling up to someone at night. I, I That's one of those little pleasures I never, you know, just being able to reach out and feel Kathy next to me. Um, I'll never take that for granted uh -huh. again because I slept alone for a long time and I like yeah. having a loved one next to me. And it's a, one of those small things in life, but, uh, you know, I can never be too grateful for it. So. Absolutely. So what you're saying is those of us still single are building up our gratitude reservoirs. <laughs> yeah. Preparation. It ends with appreciating whatever you have now. And, right. and uh, learning to love your life. And I think people, people who uh, are positive are much more attractive to the kind of people they would want. To Absolutely. Have. So I, have, I see a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Yep. Um, so let me, sorry, I'm, I lost one. So we had one from Stacy. I don't know if there was another one. Um, who is asking how you can support someone who is going through a divorce, even if you haven't been married or divorced yourself. Mm, good one. Um, 
by the book. <laughs> um, because the thing is, is that's what we wrote it for, is to be supportive and, and to be helpful. And, and I think anyone who's not been through a divorce, um, this can help them understand a lot. In fact, uh, we have a, a former bishop who read our book and he said it would have been so valuable for me to have read this book and then been able to use that in my ministry and my ward, you know, for the, all the singles in my ward. So um, you recommend um, someone who's currently going through a divorce to read your book or is this more focused like, okay, you've gone through the divorce, you're kind of on the other side, now let's either one move forward. I was thinking more along the lines of if someone is trying to give advice to someone who's been divorced, so like a, a, a counselor or a bishop or a friend, um, the book can help, I think, them relate to what they're experiencing. Um, I think also there's times too when, I know that, I, I mean, I was self-aware enough when I was going through my divorce to know that I would wear any one person out. And so <laughs> I developed a wide circle. I reached out to old friends from, you know, missionary companions to high school friends, to college friends. I, I had developed this whole circle and I'm still really grateful to all those people for putting up with me during that. But, um, but I knew if I kept telling my story to one person, they were going to not be able to stand me. <laughs> she spread it around. <laughs> spread the wealth. <laughs> yeah. But I think one thing that really helped me, uh, you know, I think sometimes people don't think they know what to say or how to help, and so they kind of avoid you. And one thing I would say, if you have a loved one going through it, um, listening is probably more important than anything you're gonna say. So be a good listener. Um, and, and then sometimes it would have been nice to just have somebody say, hey, come on over Thursday night, it's March Madness, let's watch a basketball game and get a pizza and feel normal. Um, that's such a great, you know, anything like that is just such a great break. I mean, for Kathy, it might've been a girl's night or something, but such a nice break from, you know, the hell you're going through. So I, I think you don't necessarily have to be a therapist to help somebody who's going through a divorce, you know, yep. as you can be, but sometimes just being loving and being a good listener is a huge thing. I would say that's half of the best therapy is just sort of that anyway, you know, I, I think I add a little to that, but, but that's powerful in and of itself for sure. Oh, it is. All right. Thank you. Okay. We've got one more question, Brian, come on up. Good evening. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's not so much a question as, is uh, my own thoughts on that subject. If somebody is going through a divorce, when I was going through my divorce, I was alone. Uh, my mother lives in Florida. My dad lived in Southern California, but when he found out his very first words he said were, leave me out of it. Mm. And I struggled with resentment for a very long time against my uh, the person who was then my state president because there was one person who was spending a good amount of time with me, listening to me and supporting me but that person was a woman and he told me point blank using the phrase as your stake president, I counsel you to cut off all contact with her. It, yeah, whenever you're going through a divorce, it, I, I don't understand why people in this church so often, even those who are divorced, avoid the people who are going through a divorce. I had a chance to speak with That's a, a good point. And I told him that that is when people need the most support and it's far easier to get support from, from other churches. There's even support groups that other churches sponsor, but I think from our church. And I think it is particularly isolating for men. Um, for one thing, I think in the church, women tend to get compassion and men tend to get suspicion in those circumstances. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not saying that's true and, and in every case, but I, I think it's often true. And, and one thing I would say to anyone who has friends or family going through a divorce is don't, don't think you have to decide who to support, who to love. Don't think yeah. you have to decide who It's not about who agrees with, you don't have to agree with yeah. them. Just right. listen 
and be supportive. You don't have to determine who was at fault. Um, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it's, it's not important that you have determined who you think was at fault. You just have to, to be there and show up and give love unconditionally. And that'll do more than, than almost anything. You know, I would love to read the dedication page really quick, if you don't mind. You bet. Please. Okay. To nope. all singles, and remember mid-singles, anyone <clears throat> up people above uh, their 20s, uh, beyond the possibility of a first marriage in their 20s. That's, that's the definition. So to all mid-singles who've been disappointed in past relationships and desire a more joyful life. This is the book we wish we had when we were where you are now. We love you. We believe in you. We wish the best for you. This book is also written to support loved ones and church leaders in supporting mid-singles. So that's part of our mission with this book is not just to support mid-singles directly, but also the people who love them, who don't understand, yeah. who haven't been taught how to understand. Right. Absolutely. Well, Jeff and Kathy, um, I just want to say thank you for coming on. I love you guys. This, this has been fantastic. And uh, I love your story. I love how much you guys just, you know what you're talking about. You were there. You've been down this road and other people who may not get it. I mean, I think a lot of people in the uh, mid-singles program have probably dealt with bishops or other people in their ward or what have you that are just, I've never been divorced. I can't really empathize. Cool. Well, I've got something that might help you. And this book could definitely do that. You guys are great. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank and you. your Thank book you is very much. Yes. Um, we, we would also love to have any of you who want join our love and later years group on Facebook. Yes. Look us Absolutely. up. Yes. So our love and later years group on Facebook is awesome. We really have a lot of supportive dialogue going there. If there's something that you are concerned about, um, if you post it, you'll get a lot of really great feedback um, from love people who are loving. It's not just a singles group. I just want to just, it's more of a support group. Um, it, it, um, and we invited former mid-singles like us who have been there um, because they give great counsel. We've invited therapists um, and other life coaches just anyone that we felt would be helpful to that community and that has a has a passion there. Um, and then we'll have also people have been asking about the podcast that we have. It's LilyPod. Um, and on our website at loveinlateryears.com, we have links to everything that we offer, including our weekly Lily letter. So we send a, a weekly like elevating Lily letter with um, usually a link to our podcast, our current podcast. And um, we also have our Lily Gems. So for anyone who's not big into social media, everything that Jeff writes um, on our Facebook page and everything I've written on Instagram at Love in Later Years is Lily Gems. So there's a lot of free things to read and listen to um, besides our book. So what we'll do, um, we'll get together with you both and try and get a list of links and we'll have them on our site as well. I just posted a link to your Facebook group. Um, if that doesn't work, please let me know. I, Facebook and me, because we're going live right now, it keeps wanting to revert over to the live and go. So I've kind of kept it shut down. Uh, so yeah, we will provide some of those. We will also provide a link to your book as soon as it becomes live in a few weeks, right? Yeah. Well, we're hoping we'll, we're going to have pre-order links as soon as uh, we've got a few big things going on this week. Um, I think it'll probably happen next week. Okay. Um, and then that'll be pre-orders and then uh, the release date. That's what we anticipate is 511. Everything is really, really close. Like we've got, this is our third proof and it was um, really close when it came and we just had a few little tweaks and we'll, um, and uh, yeah, it's really, it's pretty solid. Love that. Love that. And we've been privy to an advanced copy and I can just tell you that it is fantastic. Thank so you. if anybody is wondering if the book is as good as this podcast was tonight, the answer is yes, probably better. So you don't get me making dumb comments the whole time. The book is solid. 
throughout. Yeah. So the, yeah. all the math is sound. That's yes. right. We don't have yeah. any math. And all the math section works out right. There is a study guide at the end for those who are wondering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. So thank you both for being on. This is fantastic. And uh, I am so grateful for your time and for your book and for your effort in putting this together. And honestly, being led by the spirit to kind of put this together, because I think this is going to definitely help a lot of people. So thank you both. All right. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. OK, so I'm going to go ahead now and end the stream on Facebook and stop the recording.